All right. So those one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people who are present, uh, can you just share with me how far you have progressed in the literature survey part that you had undertaken? First of all, are there people who are doing seminar this year? Can you raise your hands? One, two, three, four, five. Okay. So how far have you progressed? Okay. What about you? Also doing seminar. Ah, uh, okay. Any other person who is doing seminar this year? This semester? Yeah. So how much have you progressed in your literature survey? No papers yet. Two or three. Okay. What about you? So when you say we, you mean uh, there are a group of students, is it? Achha, achha. If I notice, most people, majority of them, are actually looking at specified papers. Generally, two, three, four, five, six or seven kind of thing. But very few seem to have followed only one so far. Has actually perused a whole lot of literature and collected about 25 papers, right? Now, that was the approach that we had suggested as part of the communication skills course. So, that is a mandatory assignment, by the way. That has not been done. Uh, those of you who are already busy looking at very specific papers in details might feel that this is a waste of time. Because you have already identified either jointly with your guide or individually, a few papers which appear to be definitely relevant to the topic that you are working. Having done that, it does not seem to be very useful to go back in time and look at or identify or uh, search for some 40, 50 papers in that field, right? So that is correct as far as your seminar is concerned. Because that's the approach you are following, guided by either your friends, yourself, or your guide, or whatever. And I have no problems with that. But as far as this course is concerned, we had outlined a methodology, even though you have not followed that sequence, but it is important that you do that task. You will recall that I had uploaded a sample of, I think, summaries of three or four papers, where I had said, what would you write about a paper? I had even suggested that if you have a soft copy, you can just cut and paste and include it, provided you read that abstract. If not, you would have to type in a few lines describing that paper. But there were two important components of that exercise. One was, you methodically learn and in fact, uh, entrench it in your head as to how to correctly write the complete reference. The names of the author, the title, the publication place, etc., etc. So that is something which is an important exercise and you should be able to do it for a large number of people. The second thing is, this exercise would help you increase your bread in whatever field you are working. Now, we have a dilemma that you have progressed already in your seminar literature survey by doing these exercises. You will still have to go back in time. Uh, I have requested Firuza to create an upload link where all of you will have to submit a list of, I would say, a large number of papers pertaining to your field of study in your seminar. We already agreed that those who are not doing a formal seminar can take up any one topic which I will describe very shortly any one of the end topics that we'll list. And since it is not a formal seminar for which you are working, you would do relatively less work as compared to other colleagues who are required to do a seminar formally, but still substantiate this approach that for the chosen field, you will select 
or search for a few papers which appear prima facie relevant. As I said, flipping through them, just looking at the abstract and noting it down. And then reading maybe at least one paper more thoroughly and providing a literature survey only comprising of that paper. So this is for those who are not formally registered for a seminar. All those who are registered for a seminar, the submission has to be more elaborate. You have to have a list of 30, 40, 50 papers. Number is not important, like somebody already has 20 papers uh, identified. You might want to search a few more just to ensure that you have adequate breadth. But that is an activity that has to be done. It will take at least one day of work. You can do it over three or four days or whatever. I am stipulating next week. So next Tuesday, so next Monday evening will be the submission date for the first submission, which is, I repeat again, which is a summary of a large number of papers. I will leave large undefined. It need not be 50 or 40 or 30, it could even be 20. But there has to be a representation of breadth on whatever topic you choose. This submission will have to be made before next Tuesday. And next Tuesday is what? 22nd. So next Tuesday will be that submission. Exactly one week from then, uh, which is uh, April 29th March. Exactly one week from then, 29th March, you will have to submit your literature survey portion for the chosen topic of seminar. And the first part can be edited using any editor. You must submit two files, an editable file. So if it is a LaTeX thing, then a LaTeX file. If it is a word processor that you are using, that word processor file. And in addition, a PDF file. So these two files you will have to submit by 20 seconds. The second submission, which will follow one week later, should be done using LaTeX. Because that is the way I expect you to submit your regular uh, literature survey or the seminar report. We will follow this up by individual presentations on your research topic, which will be done in the first and second week of April. We will announce the schedule. These will be longer presentations and you should treat them as actually a practice session. When are your formal seminar presentations? They will be before the NSEM or after the NSEM? Or oh, they are after the NSEM. Good, then you will have a, a mock uh, dress rehearsal uh, before the NSEM so that you can actually do that. You are most welcome to invite your guides also for that mock seminar, if you so wish. Uh, but we will record it and we will keep that recording available. Since I have been a bit tardy in uh, ensuring enough enthusiasm for physical attendance in the class sessions, and you can see the result. I will swing my pendulum to the other extreme and insist that unless these two submissions are made, people will get a fail grade in this course. And there is no compromise with that. That announcement with a mail will go to everyone. So one week hence, a summary document listing briefs of as many papers as you wish. As I said, 20, 30, 40, 50, whatever numbers you can go through. For those who have a regular seminar topic, for others who will select one of the topics that I will mention, because this is not a part of their registered seminar, and therefore all those people will be doing an extra work, I would suggest that they would try to get the breadth in that particular chosen topic by just searching for, say, maybe 5, 7, 10 papers. So limit your time, not the amount of work that you do. And that is the time you would spend those who are not registered for a regular seminar. Such people in their second submission are expected to study only one or two papers of their choice in depth and submit a literature survey of those two papers. Others should be guided by whatever is the regular seminar guidance you are getting from your guide. 
and whatever papers like you have already reviewed seven papers or something right so if such is an activity then i would like all of that to be reflected in the literature survey for your formal seminar is that a fair game fine the papers you have collected yeah till now yeah and then they like they can be extracted no not they can be they all to there there should not be any detail assessment of the paper at all oh there seems to be some confusion there are two documents that you are supposed to submit for the first document i have already uploaded long time ago a sample description of what this collection of small abstracts is that's right so i think it contains some three or four papers arbitrarily selected from teaching computer programming and i had collected the references where the references were properly written that is the more important part and the abstract was simply cut and pasted the only requirement was that you must read that abstract line by line it is not cut and paste so you read it that is your first perusal just that abstract okay if in addition you can flip through the paper as sahana murthy had suggested that would be useful but the whole exercise is to enhance your breadth of knowledge in that particular that's the first submission the second submission is the proper literature survey part of your seminar report that you would be submitting uh, for your credit and that literature survey should actually contain a more detailed understanding of a few papers and every paper that you have cited in that literature survey should be put at the end of the reference list so in short if my seminar write up is going to be chapter 1 introduction chapter 2 literature survey chapter 3 something something i want only the chapter 2 literature survey portion to be submitted as part of the assignment for this but the list of references that you will quote because you might be preparing that list for your entire seminar report it might be slightly longer than the actual references that you have cited only in the literature survey. please do feel free for example if you so wish to submit the draft of entire uh, seminar report if you are ready by then but the dates are sacrosanct next tuesday the first submission and following tuesday the second submission i do hope that this will help in speeding up your activity for your seminar topic so what about out like uh, we are not aware of the proper format of the seminar file sorry like you said that first chapter will be introduction second will be literature it depends on, so on how you decide to organize your seminar report based on your discussion with your guide because there is no fixed format per se so your entire seminar report may be just uh, one section without a name or number or it could follow the footsteps of a regular mtech project or a phd thesis which has chapter sections and so on Mm. but that is a matter between you and your guide okay there is no fixed format for that like you were telling no as far as this course is concerned i want you to minimally submit the literature survey portion of your seminar whether it is a separate uh, chapter or a section or something is up to you okay. but what it must accompany is the list of references which you will cite in the literature survey so what is important is to ensure that your citation is appropriately made so if you cite reference number 2 somewhere or reference number uh, let's say hk 74 then in the list of references that hk 74 should be appropriately identifiable with the list correctly uh, mentioning all the details that are required as per either ieee or department standard authors uh, uh, title yeah that's right any doubt about that so firuza today we'll upload the link and we'll send a mail it may come late tonight because or it may come tomorrow by the way the link will be uploaded tomorrow so those who are already ready might have to wait at least for one day now let me come back to the discussion that we had on the issue of building and nurturing collaborative communities 
although as i said this is a generic topic meant to be handled by those students who are not registered for any regular seminar this topic is of general interest and definitely of specific interest to computer scientists all over the world who are actually trying to build systems which will permit this the other day we identified players so contributors reviewers uh, teaching assistants teachers all all kinds of names were given and i only pointed out how synthesis is difficult and how just writing down unique taxonomy could tax us so much that we may not be able to uniquely identify or even agree to different names for something similar today i propose to look at some of the actions that these players will take actions which result in something tangible that needs to be handled by the system that we build can you see that okay the first thing we talk about is contributions like the reports that you are going to write are your contributions the contributions could take many forms for example there could be an article the article could be a research paper essay note and i have put dot 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 saying you can actually expand on as many things as you can think of technically since i'll be dealing with text and images and audio video i have generically written photographs to represent images and written video clip why these three types they could em embrace any field of activity by the way but generically when we speak of content what comes to our mind is a written text or a photograph or an image or an audio video clip when i say video clip it subsumes audio so i have not written it separately but there could be an audio clip itself as a content which could be given up once a contribution is made by anyone the contribution needs to be assessed so how do you carry out assessment one thing that occurs to us as students and teachers is grading do we do grading ordinarily for every contribution that is made when we talk about manual or automatic grading in the context of education or teaching and learning what kind of contributions we are trying to grade answer books in a class test or a quiz or submissions of the project reports for a course project or submission of your literature survey for example if it has to be graded generally large scale submissions are to be graded either manually or automatically but this brings us to another question did we write as part of the contributions here did we write a test paper or an exam paper or a quiz would that not be a contribution so we will have to add that to the contribution list this is a very simple example of how our process of thinking and elaborating has to be iterative so that is why when we write contributions it might be prudent to write this in a separate page and keep this as a growing list i will show that as contribution plus on a separate slide but in practice this is what you should do that whenever you think about let's say assessment types grading now you suddenly realize oh grading is done for answer books and where are the answer books as a contribution not listed okay if answer book is a contribution question paper is also a contribution where is question paper listed here then i suddenly realize there have to be quizzes there have to be project problems there have to be tutorials so all of these become additional contribution types which i must incorporate under continuum this is what i meant by iteration when i start looking at something else i remember that i have done a bit of a sloppy thinking on some previous site and i have enlarged that 
assessment by voting are you familiar with this all the uh, many contests on the tv shows so how how do you decide who is the top singer there is of course an examination panel and so on but have you not come across voting vote for me and the person who gets maximum votes is declared a winner what do you think is the sanctity of such a voting process depends on the depends on the crowd in what way can you elaborate if the crowd is knowledgeable okay depends on sentiment so knowledgeable depends on sentiment this is a third dimension i might want to add is a perception i might not be knowledgeable i might have no sentiment involved in one of the three contestants but i have a perception take music for example i may not be very knowledgeable to understand what raga is being sung or how well prepared that uh, singer is so i am not knowledgeable as she says i have no sentiment because all the three people are unknown to me i don't know but my perception depends upon how i feel when i listen to the singing of that person because music relates to your soul in a way now if there are three contestants on whom i am voting i might genuinely vote based on my perception of how i like a particular song not the person or how i like the particular thing so this could be a third parameter is it possible at all to analyze a given vote to find out whether that vote was cast based on knowledgeability whether that vote was cast based on the sentiment which is often could be a political process there are a lot of my friend comes and tells me are fatak vote for that person so that is also sentiment which is being artificial or whether the voting was based on my perception now you would agree that you would like to count the votes which are given a based on knowledge and b based on perception but not necessarily on sentiment of any other kind including influences but is it possible to distinguish no uh, general voting it says either rank votes number 1 number 2 number 3 or this person and no one else or if if it is voting in terms of what you like best is it thousand submissions 20 get the best of this thing the majority wins kind of thing okay surprisingly what has been found is that if the crowd is large enough and if you can actually do some kind of partitioning based on identity amongst the crowd of people who have previously voted and they have actually assigned the best grade to artifacts which were termed as based by a majority of people including a subsequent review process etc which i'll come to so there is a lot of science behind this uh, kind of voting based on the crowd and based on an appropriate partitioning which we'll look at later now about peer review all of you used to be familiar with peer review how many of you have published a paper or sent a paper for publication 1 2 3 4 so you are aware of the process that when you submit a paper it is reviewed by a panel and generally you will get a feedback okay now comes an interesting part first of all the review is often blind that means you don't know who reviewed it to enhance the effectiveness of the review if i know that my name will not be declared i am likely to be more truthful and rather harsh in reviewing and giving the feedback but what does that feedback result in so i give you a feedback let us say you have submitted a paper and there is a panel which collectively adjudges the submission at level 6 but says that if the following shortcomings of the submitted paper can be taken care of and paper be revised 
then it might be upgraded to 7 or 8, which probably is the minimal requirement for acceptance. You all agree that this is the normal peer review process, but then this will result in other contribution, which is the revised draft. Have we listed that under our contributions up there? We have not. So that means we will have to add the revision and the revision process also as part of contribution. So at this stage, I have put this slide as contribution plus. That means I have a separate page on which I started writing contribution types. I had forgotten to add, you remember, quiz, test, examination, tutorial, project description, set of problems, etc., etc. These are all submissions and these are relevant to the field of education in fact. These may not be relevant in some other context, but they are relevant here. It might be useful to actually write a context. So you are also developing a taxonomy as you write the different types of uh, content, okay, which you need to handle. The second point which just arose when we discussed the peer review mechanism, that there will have to be revision. Now, when you talk about very large scale content contribution review, etc., etc., you need to introduce a solid mechanism for version control. So, how do you control your versions? I remember uh, 40 years ago when I started teaching programming, uh, uh, you, you, you did not have files on a desk because there was no desk. There used to be bunch of cards that you punched your program in. That was from 74 onwards. Before that, it was a paper tape. So there is no, no question of a file name for a program. You actually own that bunch of cards and that is your program. So you say, what is the name of this program? You say, DB Fata. That's, that's, that's my card deck. When I submit it at a place, I would be submitting it under my roll number and name and they would assign a number to that, um, like an inward number. Three days later, when I go to the same window, I will get that take back and a printout of the compilation. Usually for the first attempt, the printout used to be one page only, which had only half page, which would say that the control cards themselves were not properly read. So whole deck is written. I modify that, submit it again. So it used to be one single compilation. It was not uncommon to have three visits to that window, which means eight to nine days. Can you imagine that situation? To compile a program correctly, it would take nine days. Not nine minutes, not nine seconds, not one ninth of a second. So those were hard days and therefore, revision control became essential when we had to spin off a program, which was a working program, but we had to modify something. When you modified it, what would happen is that the modified program would stop working. Now you are required to reconstruct your original program because that was working. And the changes that you have made, if, if you are not clear of what changes you have made where, then you are sunk. In fact, when the first Unix systems developed, you will notice that the notion of delta that came in, it came in precisely because of such requirements. But I digress. In case of content, the revision and version control has to be implicit. And if we are talking about building a very large system, then we must provide this version control to the contributors. You cannot expect individual contributors who, remember we are talking about uh, building and nurturing large collaborative communities. A single community could be 10,000, 15,000 people strong. And you cannot expect every one of those 15,000 people to have recourse to appropriate computer tools. So many might depend upon what tools are provided by the system. And therefore, revision control has to be inbuilt here. In any case, whenever a formal submission is made, if that submission is a revision of a previous submission, independent of how the original author is maintaining revisions at his or her end, I must maintain these revisions in the system. 
that is a requirement that is why it is required. so again to come back i will always have a growing list what i have said contributions contributions could keep on growing and therefore i must always maintain a growing list as and when i come across something new something additional i must write it after the contents are revised or something they have to finally pass muster so for example when your paper is accepted for publication okay it goes to a publication publication house publishing house so elsevier or whatever one some company tata magro hill whatever what does that company do now does it accept the final manuscript as cleared by the peer review process saying the paper is accepted and just publish whatever format you have submitted your paper in they do that so have you heard of editorial boards what do editorial boards do what do editors do editors will ensure a variety of things but the main crux is that whatever material is finally published is absolutely perfect in terms of both its appearance and content in the context of the publication magazine that it is supposed to be contained for example certain scientific journals insist that no political views be expressed i might have inadvertently in one of the paragraphs mentioned something about uh, some place which my peers who are evaluating only the technical content might have overlooked but the editorial board must say that no this is not all some simple grammatical mistakes might be overlooked by peers again because they are concentrating on the content an editorial board cannot neglect that the language that is used has to be perfect has to be proper has to be correct a format would be prescribed for publication two column format this format this font you know all the regulations for example i typically publishes them and you are required to follow them generally to ease that final process many people insist that your initial contribution themselves must be in that form but it is not necessary in any case you would have finally an editorial board and therefore editing of content would be an important activity let us look at the names of people and tasks that i have mentioned editorial team how is editorial team selected for let's say it uh, uh communications or it pali journal and computer any idea how is the editorial team selected if you have seen a journal you would see the editorial team there often the editorial team is augmented by nominations so people are nominated the very senior well known professors who have actually published good quality papers are invited to join the editorial board and you'll suddenly find their name appearing so editorial boards of such large technical literature is often done by nomination when you have a crowd how do you nominate voting so what kind of voting so let's say there are 10000 people in a community and you want to create an editorial board for that community let's say that community looks at a specific sub sub topic data structures and algorithms so the, there is a community which actually works together on data structures and algorithms there are 10000 people in the community they all become members through your earlier mechanisms we have not yet discussed them but assume that they have become so how do you go about voting do you ask all 10000 people that please select some members say five from the remaining 9999 and on what basis do you want 10000 people to submit their biodata and each one to read all 9999 submissions 
half the population of your community will disappear if we ask such things to be done. So direct voting for that editorial board kind of thing will not work. It is not a meaningful lecture. Any other suggestions? Reputation. Yeah, reputation. So remember, when we are talking about a few people or a small community, the reputation is known to a large number of people. But when you are talking about 10,000 people who have arbitrarily joined that community because you have opened it up saying, this is a community I want. How do you manage that reputation? How, how do you understand or capture that reputation? Okay, so here is one possible way. One possible way is that to kickstart the process, you ask all 10,000 people to make some contributions. Then you ask all those people in partition groups to assess those contributions. Yes. Then you quantify the assess contents and the assessors. Find out which contents have been assessed as the best quality. So you say scale 1 to 10 and you just look at only those contents which have been assessed as 10 or 9. Now you find out who are the people who assess those 10 or 9 content and are there any commonality? You may do this process automatically but iteratively. So you may get the same content assessed by multiple people, particularly those who filter up or who which bubble up. So you can set up a process, an automated process which will actually throw out the reviewers who generally do good things correctly. That means they are able to decipher between a good quality and a bad quality. But you want to arrive at this judgment automatically based on the work which itself is part and parcel of the building of community. This is one possibility. We do not know whether it will work or not, but this is one possibility. Similarly, we have to think of other possibilities to create such teams automatically. It is not just the team selection, but leadership. Please remember that in a crowd, leadership is voluntary. So, the task allocation which is to be done both to the leaders and by the leaders for the entire community. Auto-monitoring of the activities of the people. If 10,000 people who form that community, if you find that about 1,000 of them have not participated even in one activity for more than two months, by prior announcement you can say that such people will be removed from the community. Others can join. So there is a dynamic equilibrium of some kind. Clearance by the editorial team for some contents which have been reviewed. And this clearance will require adherence to all the formatting specifications, this, that, that, etc. And finally, it will result in a publication. Now, these are the tasks which are ordinarily done in small community. We are talking about automating these tasks and automating these activities for crowds and not for one kind of crowd but for different crowds or different subsets of crowds. So we are really, really talking about building a system which will permit building and nurturing collaborative communities in large numbers. So I can think of about 2,000 communities coming up, each one with a minimum membership of 10,000 people. And even that number is a minuscule proportion of the population of just this country, not the global population. That is the sort of dream. In that context, I have listed here some topics which might be relevant for developing such large system here. We are obviously in a communication skills course, not talking about developing that software, but we are talking about doing literature survey on one part, a partial literature survey, or one part, one of the end parts, which together might actually contribute to building this. So here are, here is a sample list. For example, content management it will require content management. Currently, we are looking at Drupal as the content management. How many of you are familiar with Drupal? One. Oh, very few. Oh, wow. There is a very thriving global community of Drupal. We had actually a, a, 
global uh, event here in IIT Bombay recently. They are all computer science people, not even heard of Drupal? I heard of it, I said. Okay. So, all of you know the spelling. Useful. Uh, anyway, but that is something that we would like to explore. In particular, we know, for example, that the latest version of Drupal has a set of powerful APIs, in fact, an API mechanism, which will permit systems to be constructed where Drupal is the binding glue and through APIs you can connect to anything and any everything behind it. So that is something that we are building the national virtual library also using that glue. Incidentally, the local expert in IIT Bombay is not a computer science professor, but a professor in chemical engineering, Professor Sundar. So those of you who are interested can look at uh, him. The second thing is crowdsourcing. Now this term you are all familiar with. Have you read any papers on crowdsourcing? No, you have one, two, five. So I have just given one sample name here, just like I gave one sample, Drupal. Professor Mausam, who is professor at IIT Delhi, has written some papers. So those of you who are going to do some literature survey on crowdsourcing might just limit themselves to look at Professor Mausam's papers and work as far as this course is concerned. The third item I have written is cloud computing. Now, cloud, many people should be familiar with? Not many. What is happening? Your CS department students, right? One, two, three, four. Cloud computing you are not familiar with? Generally familiar. How many of you know about OpenStack Cloud? One, two, very few. So what do you know about cloud? Virtualization? Have you studied virtualization? I, I now have to talk seriously to the head of the CS department because I find uh, minimal required thing in the 21st century that must be known to every CS graduate uh, somehow are not exactly vociferously available. They are sort of available here. It's not good. Uh, I will tell you cloud computing has to be minimally understood by everyone. So it's not part of the communication skills course, but I would advise that a part of the computer science skills course should acquire adequate knowledge about cloud computing. In any case, in this particular instance, we want to look at the OpenStack cloud implement. So what is cloud? What are the different uh, virtualization mechanisms that are available, etc., uh, etc.? Et I don't know, but if, I mean, has nobody worked on things like process migration in a virtualized environment and such things? or not read any papers or any literature or any textbook on it. This, this is a serious lacuna as an independent observation from a uh, teacher in computer science. I would say that you should acquire that knowledge. However, agile development, how many of you have heard of this? Many, good. Agile development is, if you have studied software engineering, the conventional classical waterfall model, iterative model, etc., etc. But today, most people who are using agile development methodology, so this is related to software development. And the last is project management. Project management is not something that is unfortunately taught very carefully to engineering students in general and to computer science students. It is considered part of the management. Uh, how many of you have done a course in project management or a studied a topic in project management as part of some other course? Nobody. This is, a, those of you who are going to join the profession after passing out from here and are going to work in industries, better learn as much as you can about project management. It's, an, it's a vital thing because you will all be working in teams and teams cannot deliver unless proper project management is put in place. How many of you have heard of Jira? One, two, three, four, very few. So Jira is another important open source software tool often used in the past for software bug tracking. So software developers used to use Jira very, very effectively for managing their software development projects. 
a very large number of open source projects all over the world, particularly the large ones, use Jira. Jira also has a management component, a project management component. In this particular instance, I am talking about project management. I will upload these slides as a PDF file today, but this is the list one, two, three, four, five. Those people who are not registered for a regular seminar as a part of their activity this semester are requested to pick up any one of these unless they have already chosen a topic. Because someone said you are reading a book, for example. So that is perfectly fine. So those of you who have not fixed a topic and are not doing a formal seminar are encouraged to pick any one of these and make your submissions next week and subsequent week based on this. Is that okay? Fine. The submissions are mandatory. Attendance is still not mandatory, but submission is mandatory. And those of you who actually wish to attend, like many of you came, uh, I would suggest that it will be useful if a 8.30 session starts at 8.30 and not at 8.45. As, as a humble request, from me and about six of your colleagues who were there from 8.25 onwards. So for their sake, at least, if all of you can show up in time, it will be useful. Let us see on Thursday morning if the session can start with your kind cooperation at 9.30 sharp. Thank you.